There is nothing funny about Purim. They tried to kill us. And yet, it is the happiest day. Happiest. Why? Because it's one thing to be happy about your soul and about your uh, beliefs and about your values and the quality of life and all that heavy stuff. It's another thing to be happy just to be alive, physically alive. So on other holidays where the days are holier, it's a time of joy and a time of happiness, but it's kind of a spiritual, holy, uh, heavenly happiness. The body doesn't understand what you're so happy about. But on Purim, our bodies survived because the threat was to the body. So we celebrate by eating a little better and drinking a little better. And the body is happy. Well, that's a different kind of happiness. It's not frivolous. It's not Halloween. It's Purim. So we do a few serious things, like hear the entire Megillah, the story of Esther. We also give charity to at least two people. And we share food with at least one person. And we eat a festive meal. Those are the serious things. The rest is a matter of good mood. Good mood. Because we are forever immune to the threat of genocide because we know it ain't going to happen. In fact, Mordechai says to Esther, risk your life and go to the king and ask him to protect the Jews, to save the Jews. Not that the Jews need saving. Can you believe this? That's what Mordechai said. Go ask the king to save the Jews, although the Jews don't need saving. Because one way or the other, Jews will always be. But if you can play some little part in uh, making things better, in bringing about the miracle, then you can, then you can even risk your life for it, and it would be justified. Because to fulfill the purpose for which each of us comes into this world, even though it's only a tiny contribution compared to the rest of the world, but if that's what I'm here for then my life is meaningful because of it, so I will invest my life in it. That's what Mordechai was saying to Esther. You became queen, not by accident, not by coincidence, not for no reason. You became queen for a reason. Now this might be the reason. So do everything, everything you can to fulfill the reason for which you were created. And when you do that, of course, there's happiness. The happiness comes in four levels. In Hebrew, la yehudim hoisa oira v'simcha v'sosay v'kar. How do you translate that into English? Jews had... Light, oira, simcha, happiness, sosain, joy, vikar, and glory, pride. So here are the four things. Light, which here doesn't mean uh, light-hearted. It means their burdens were lightened. Relief, that's the least, right? At least you're relieved of a threat or a concern or an anxiety. That allows you to be happy. When you're happy, you can actually rejoice. Show that you're happy. But the fourth thing, the most important thing is we regained our dignity regained our pride. After the Holocaust, where the world really thought we were done, 
that we were finished. What do they call it? The final solution? Hmm. Here we are celebrating Purim. The most important part of it is not so much the relief, not so much the, the happiness, and not so much the joy. It's the regaining of our dignity, of our Jewish pride. We have something so valuable, so important, and so true to share with the world. We've got to do it with confidence. We've got to do it with joy. We've got to do it with, with happiness but we have to do it with confidence. Now here's a little known and a little uh, appreciated aspect of the story of Purim. King Ahasuerus, who ruled over 127 countries, on the third year of his reign, he felt secure. Although he wasn't of royal blood, and he had been very insecure when he first started, but now it's been three years, he's getting, he's getting to be a little comfortable and confident. He demands that his wife, who was also celebrating in her own celebration, her own uh, company, he asks her to come entertain the men. She refuses. Not out of great, out of great virtue, but she wasn't looking her best. So she refuses. One of the advisors to the king suggested that this is a violation that cannot be forgiven. Word will get out to all the women in the kingdom that the queen was summoned and she did not come. And then women all over the country are going to disobey their husbands. Can't have that. So she must be dealt with very severely. She must be put to death. Who advised this? Well, guess who? Haman. Haman. Whose name we erase with noise every time he's mentioned. Then, being the sophisticated, intelligent individual that he was, he also passed a law. And the law said, every man should rule in his home and speak in his native tongue. See, there are 127 countries. People married each other across borders of 127 countries. Many of them speak different languages. So when you marry someone from a different country, which language are you going to speak at home? Well, Haman had a brilliant idea. The only language you're allowed to speak is the language of the husband. So what exactly was the decree? To make life in Persia wonderful? That every man should be a ruler in his home and that, he should, that they should speak in his language. This, this lasted for a long time, by the way. In some places, it still exists. The word for ruling in Hebrew, in this particular verse, was sereir, which kind of suggests a dictator. In Hebrew, when we say king, we're talking about a benevolent monarch. A king is someone who the people choose, the people anoint. So it's more of a democratic process. As we say uh, in, the, in the text of the prayers, God's kingdom they accepted willingly upon themselves. So kingdom, royalty, is a democratic condition the people have to want. Whereas ruler, that sounds more like uh, unwilling, um, forced, imposed. 
So Haman wanted to impose this law on the women. Terrible. Sounds really terrible. But you know that after they ate from the tree of knowledge, God says to Eve, to Chava, you will yearn for your husband and he will rule over you. Isn't that the same distasteful statement? See, but you got to be so careful when you read the text because words mean something. In that particular case, God says, he, your husband, will rule in you, not over you, in you. He will, re he will rule in you. Meaning to say, because you yearn for your husband, you want him to rule for you, not over you. Every woman wants her husband to be the man. That's what satisfies a wife's, wife's needs. So it's not ruling over, it's ruling within. Huge difference. Haman didn't seem to be that sensitive. He said, rule over. Rule over his home. And so it's not surprising that Haman was also anti-Semitic. He was also um, genocidal. Once you start down a bad path, so is it any wonder that we rejoice with the failure of Haman's plans, of Haman's schemes, of Haman's philosophy of life? It's to be celebrated. So happy Purim. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal. It's questions and answers. It's conversation. It's really relaxed. It's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program. There's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us. Take a look. Click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best. And join us for some enjoyable conversation.